Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'll start by saying it's really refreshing to see faces in the auditorium again. Um, today, it is uh, my pleasure to actually reintroduce uh, Dr. Dan Fulton. Uh, Dr. Fulton uh, attended to his undergraduate education here at Iowa State and uh, then attended medical school at the University of Minnesota, uh, did his uh, internal medicine residency at Hennepin County, and then his infectious disease fellowship at the University of Iowa. Um, Dr. Fulton's been absolutely instrumental in shepherding us through the uh, pandemic of the last two and a half years. And uh, today, he very kindly has accepted our uh, invitation to provide us with a review of monkeypox. And I believe that he also has a couple of uh, caveats uh, uh, pertaining to COVID. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Dan Fulton. Thank you. OK, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you again for having me. Uh, so yeah, the goal today is going to be to talk about uh, monkeypox for about the first two-thirds of the talk and then uh, talk about uh, some COVID updates, particularly around the vaccine for the last third of the talk, as close as we can kind of get to that. Um, I do sort of have good news and bad news. Um, the, I mean, the, the bad news is that I've never seen a case of monkeypox. So I'm just telling you what I've learned um, by kind of, you know, as we stay up to date on what's going on. But the good news is that I've never seen a case of monkeypox. So um, we'll talk about why that is, but uh, we do seem to be making really good headway with monkeypox. And um, so it's important we all know about it and are aware of it and are ready to test and care for it. Um, but I, I do think that we've got some, some good uh, emerging news about that. So, um, okay, so I don't have any disclosures. I don't get paid by anybody to um, study drugs or anything like that. Um, but as I was thinking about this monkeypox talk, I mean, what, what struck me about this is that monkeypox has been around for a long time. Um, and, you know, there's certain things in our lives that, that have been around for a long time, and you think back, and they've been there, and you just don't really think that they ever become a big thing again, but you know there they were. And so, like I was thinking about the Karate Kid. I don't know if you guys saw this, but this came out. Uh, I was born in '81, so this was really big right when I was a kid. And the main character's name is Daniel, and so many of my friends called me Danielson, like the whole time I was a kid. <laughs> and this was a great thing, and I loved it. And I I didn't think it would uh, come back around again, um, kind of like monkeypox. Um, with uh, monkeypox, you know, when we talk about pox viruses, uh, there are several different pox viruses that infect humans. Um, the most important uh, is something called smallpox, which we're going to talk about. Uh, then there's um, vaccinia virus, which is mostly in cows and horses, but can infect humans. And then there's uh, molluscum contagiosum, which is more of a pediatrics disease. So that's uh, this disease here, uh, and then there's monkey pox, which can cause these pox marks. Um, poxes have been around as long as humans have. This is one of the pharaohs in uh, the tomb. They had uh, small pox findings um, on their skull. Uh, there, there is a challenge, though, because before we uh, had as much scientific information, other things were sort of thought to be poxes, like uh, chicken pox, for example. But as you all know, chicken pox is a herpes virus, not a pox virus. So we're going to be sticking with pox viruses today. And it is really impossible to talk about monkey pox without first talking about smallpox. And then this is where that bit of history comes in. You know, um, if you remember the movie, Johnny is like, a bad guy. Like, this is not ambiguous. Johnny is clearly bad in The Karate Kid, and that's what smallpox is. Smallpox is terrible. It killed millions of people. It was terribly disfiguring, and it accounted for some of our biggest um, pandemics in history. So here's COVID here. If we look backwards, we can see this was the smallpox pandemic that occurred in North America during the early years of colonization. Something like 50 million indigenous North Americans died. And then there are these other smallpox ones way back in history that killed a third of the people in Europe. I mean, we we're talking about terrible, terrible pandemics uh, that just wiped people out. Very contagious, 60% fatality rate. If you survived, you were likely to be blind and horribly disfigured forever. So this is a terrible, terrible disease. 
Um, which fortunately we don't have to talk about much anymore because of vaccination. So smallpox vaccine was first sort of discovered uh, in the late 1700s by Edward Jenner. And basically what happened was they realized that if people were getting vaccinia virus from cows, they were much less likely to get very sick from smallpox virus. So basically mother nature invented this vaccine for us and um, Jenner would put together this sort of serum and then vaccinate people. And lest you think that we are unique in our vaccine misinformation uh, era, this was uh, put out during those times where you can see Jenner is vaccinating this lady and this guy who's already gotten his vaccine is growing a piece of cow out of his arm <laughs> because it was a, a cowpox. Um, so clearly that didn't come to fruition and... Um, you know, this is one of the more famous smallpox photos historically. This is a pair of twin boys. Uh, this boy had been vaccinated and this boy had not. And so the vaccines here were incredibly effective. And for many years, almost every adult uh, and child, for that matter, got vaccinated against smallpox and it left this little scar. I don't know if anybody here has one of those. Um, there's a few of us out here, right. So I saw, I came across this, having a smallpox vaccine car is like walking around with the moon landing and the Sistine Chapel on your arm. <laughs> the level of significance of this vaccine to humanity cannot be overstated. This is, uh, as far as modern miracles go, the smallpox vaccine really, really did it, which resulted in uh, the eradication of smallpox from the world. So Smallpox does not have an animal reservoir. It only was in humans. So through a, a wide-ranging campaign and the effort of all humans across the world, we were able to vaccinate enough people that smallpox basically petered out and does no, it no longer exists in the human population. It does exist in a couple of labs throughout the world, which I've never liked. Um, so it is still out there. So you might be wondering, okay, yeah, but this is a smallpox talk. So what does that have to do with anything? Well, it turns out that the smallpox vaccine that so many people received is also active against monkeypox. So here's monkeypox. So you thought these pox viruses were gone. We got rid of smallpox, just like you thought that Karate Kid was gone. Uh, but turns out things go around and come around. So I don't know if anybody's heard of this Cobra Kai show. Dr. Mahaney has got me onto this show is hilarious. It's like all the same characters, <laughs> but like 40 years later. Uh, and so you thought Johnny, you know, was, was gone and out of the picture, but it turns out that Johnny is still around now without giving away what happens in Cobra Kai too much. It turns out that Johnny is maybe not as bad as he used to be. Um, so we're going to talk about monkeypox. So this is a painful rash illness that previously people would get from animals. It's called monkeypox because it, it was first described in monkeys in the 1950s. Uh, it was first described in humans in the 70s. Um, but multiple animals can carry this virus. It's a rash virus in animals also. And um, the most recent outbreak in the U.S. was in 2003 associated with prairie dogs. Um, people had these pet prairie dogs and they were touching them and it would get on the human skin. And... Uh, big outbreak back then, but it, it was all associated with direct exposure to the animals. Um, so it primarily, over the past 10 to 20 years, has circulated in African countries. Uh, there's two separate sort of subdivisions with uh, mutations. There's the clade one, which is the Congo variant, which has a higher mortality. And then there's clade two, which is the West African variant. And it, it lost a couple of the genes from clade one. And so it is uh, not nearly as severe from a, a mortality standpoint. And then there is something that's changed about that clade two, so that less mortal version that uh, seems to be what's driving uh, the current outbreak. So very painful, significant infection, uh, but does not seem to have the same level of mortality uh, as associated with clade one. Um, this was around maybe 15% mortality. Um, so very severe. I mean, kind of like our smallpox, people could die from it. So this is spread primarily through skin-to-skin -skin contact. Um, there was 
back, uh, you know, years ago, in-home transmission that might happen between humans. Uh, if somebody got it from their prairie dog and then they're at home, you know, humans in their homes touch each other, they pick up their kids and they, um, you know, are living close together. So there was some human to human in-home contact uh, where it would spread. But otherwise it never seemed like it really moved out uh, beyond that. So what happens, what has happened is as the smallpox immunity has waned, as people are no longer getting smallpox vaccine, people are no longer immune to monkeypox. And so there's been more episodes of monkeypox jumping from the animal population into the human population. And as human density and movement has increased, there's been an increased chance of that human to human transition to happen outside of homes. So um, when we are trying to look at how contagious is this, uh, when you do put sort of skin on skin, um, monkeypox is right here. So we talk about this R value and how likely is one person to spread it to another person. So the R value for monkeypox is about two. So uh, what they're seeing is one person is spreading it to two people. Uh, that puts it in line with... Um, you know, kind of the common cold virus. So at two, you would expect a fairly quick exponential growth of uh, this virus based on its transmission. It's not, you know, measles or current Omicron virus, but it's, it's moving. So what alarmed uh, public health officials was that uh, in Europe, they started to see cases of monkeypox pop up in people that had no animal exposure and no travel and no known contact with someone else who had monkeypox, which implies or shows that monkeypox is circulating in the community in a way that it hadn't before. So a um, lot of research and study has gone into this to figure out exactly why this is happening. And it does seem that this has to do with skin to skin contact that's occurring during sex. So this is not a sexually transmitted disease per se, but I told you this transmits pretty readily from skin to skin contact. So you can imagine if somebody got this rash on their genitals and then had sex with somebody, they could pass it on through that way. Then you can see how that would develop. People are continuing to have sex with each other and thus it can spread in that way. So this is really a direct contact infection. And I think you've probably seen the media try to be very careful about saying this isn't an STD but we also have to acknowledge the reality that it is moving through sexual networks because of this skin-to-skin -skin contact. And the primary sexual networks that it's moving through right now are men who have sex with men. So we have this big review that was just published a couple weeks ago of about 600 people with monkeypox. And I found this data really helpful as far as figuring out who's at highest risk of getting monkeypox right now. So 99% men, and uh, if you look at sexual orientation, about 96% uh, men who have sex with men. So that is pretty, pretty high risk factors as far as when you're trying to define what population is at highest risk. 40% of those folks were HIV positive, and um, about half of the people that were not HIV positive were on preventative medicines for HIV. So we've talked about PrEP before. So these are folks in this study that either had HIV and were already seeing their HIV doctor and were plugged in about kind of sexually transmitted diseases or people on PrEP who are also highly attuned to sexually transmitted diseases. This is important because there is a selection bias in who we're diagnosing. We're diagnosing people that are already kind of attuned to their sexual health and are aware that they need to be paying attention to unusual findings. So uh, if we also look at other main risk factors, um, if you look at the number of sexual partners in the last three months, the average was five. If you look at what percent of people had used some drugs associated with sex, that was 20%. And if you looked at people that had attended some event where um, there might be some degree of multi-partner sex happening, it was about a third. So if you think about the risk factors of how this has transmitted skin-to-skin -skin contact, this does sort of fit with that notion of it is skin-to-skin, -skin, but it is moving through a sexual network. It is impossible to talk about this without acknowledging uh, the effect of the AIDS pandemic on how we think about this. So HIV 
emerged in our population in a similar way through similar pathways. It is a sexually transmitted disease, but it was primarily being transmitted, at least at first, through men who have sex with men. However, that does not mean that's where it remained, and that does not mean that um, it doesn't affect the general population. So I think we have to take care to not um, uh, over-focus on these risk factors as the only people that might get this infection, but also acknowledge this population is who's at risk and deserves all of our attention as well. Uh, so if you have any interest in kind of the HIV pandemic and how that emerged and how uh, the gay population was really marginalized through this process, I'd encourage you to read this book because it's, it's really a, a profound story of, of how that emerged. And, and that is still one of our uh, largest, most recent pandemics and, and is ongoing. So again, in summary, how does it move around? So there's animals spread to humans, can spread in household contacts. That was sort of before, that's the old monkeypox. The new monkeypox, or what we would call non-endemic monkeypox, is uh, somebody who traveled to this area, had it, and then there was close contacts uh, within the home and is now sort of moving through uh, sexual networks because of that skin-to-skin -skin contact. Does anybody have questions on that aspect of it? Yes. Yeah. So do they have to come with skin to skin? Does it have to be an oozing? Is, is the sore or the pox already there that's open? Or there's no pox in Great question. So the, the question is kind of about contagiousness of the pox. Um, so first things first, as we've learned with COVID, sometimes people don't even have symptoms when they're starting to become contagious. But what we think is with monkeypox is as long as you have lesions that have not re-epithelialized beneath, and I'm going to show you a lot of photos so that'll make sense, that you are still contagious. And because um, these lesions are not just genital, but can also then be on the mouth and face or hands, um, these are places that people touch each other. Uh, so people that have monkeypox, it's really recommended that they self-isolate for sometimes up to four weeks uh, until these lesions are resolved. Other questions about transmission? I just think it's an important thing to, to be as sensitive as we can about because um, this is a disproportionately affecting one part of the population. Uh, they deserve all the care in the world um, to make sure that um, we're uh, doing everything we can. Uh, it can spread uh, to anyone and we just need to be aware. Uh, of, of what we're seeing. So this is um, the big data. So about 60,000 cases uh, worldwide so far. The grand majority of those have been in the United States. We're at about 22,000 cases total. Like I said, the good news is here in Iowa, we've had 20. So 20 total cases. And this number is not budging that much. It's not moving very fast. So I do think that there's been a little bit of this insulation phenomenon where uh, monkeypox sort of came to the coast and the big urban areas first and has been moving its way in. We were just starting to see our uptick of local cases here. Uh, I had tested somebody. There's been a few tests through the emergency department that have been negative. Uh, but right at that time is when the vaccine started to become available to people, which we'll talk about. So if we look at the United States sort of numbers, you can see that we were kind of going on liftoff here with an exponential increase. Uh, and then that curve has been bent back down over the past couple of weeks uh, since the vaccine has uh, become available. So when we talk about what monkeypox actually is, uh, people generally get a little bit of a systemic illness at first, fevers, feeling yucky, headaches, generalized symptoms. Um, and then uh, the rash starts and either it starts in the area where the inoculation occurred. So like in this outbreak, genital lesions, or it can actually show up around a person's mouth as sort of the preferential first place it shows up and then spreads onto the face and then goes through a, a typical development over the course of two to four weeks. So here's a couple of diagrams, um, maybe just an erythematous patch here. Then you get this pox. The pox kind of raises up, heaps up, and then craters and then forms a scab and then the skin re-epithelializes uh, beneath. I think one important thing to note is if you look at these lesions, they, they're not filled with fluid. They're filled with like a proteinaceous like material. So they seem more fleshy. So if you think about that prototypical molluscum 
lesion. Um, it is fluid, but it is more of a, a thick fluid rather than like a chicken pox or a herpes vesicle, which is a pretty thin fluid when you're trying to differentiate. Now, it's not always going to be perfect, but these tend to be more uh, tissuey, for lack of a better term. Uh, one challenge also is that um, the bugs and people don't read my books or look at my photos all the time. And so there's been plenty of examples of something that didn't look like what we think of as a monkey pox, pox uh, and it still was. So you really need to have a high uh, sense of being aware of this, especially in people that have uh, the risk factors that we've talked about. Um, one other difference is that pox viruses all emerge at once, generally speaking, and so they're at the same kind of level of development as opposed to chicken pox or herpes ones where there will be some that are later, some that are in the middle, and some that are earlier, and they all kind of look a little different. These are generally more uniform. Uh, about 20% of people with monkeypox are getting admitted to the hospital, and that is not necessarily because they've got some organ failure, life-threatening manifestations, because it hurts so much. And so if people have this in their mouth or their throat, they can't eat and they're getting dehydrated. Or if they have it perianally, they can't defecate. So these are real issues that they need pain control in order to be able to get through this process. Fortunately, organ failure is rare. Encephalitis, pneumonitis, hepatitis, kidney failure, sepsis, uh, but it is not impossible. We had our first death from monkeypox reported two days ago in somebody that was, sounds like really profoundly immunocompromised in LA. So um, definitely deserves our care and attention. It is not smallpox though. This is not a, a highly lethal disease. We can control pain uh, and we can support people through this. I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of examples now. And this is a series that was put out by the New England Journal of Medicine last week. And basically what's on the bottom here is going to be a timeline of kind of what happened to these folks. And then we're gonna see their lesions kind of develop over time. And my goal is to help you see monkeypox many times in its many manifestations so that if you run into it in your clinical setting, uh, it is more recognizable. So day minus five, this person had a sexual contact. Day zero, they started to have some painless genital lesions. Day three, they started to have some rectal discharge and their partner was diagnosed with gonorrhea, so that got treated. And then day five, from the genital lesions, they started, they had their swab done and this was diagnosed. Then day seven is when they actually got their fever and felt generally pretty ill. And day 10, they kind of had the rest of the systemic illness and got oral ulcers, kind of itched everywhere, and then moved on and got through it. So you can see an early lesion, kind of that heaped up crater starts to scab over and finally makes like the real scabbed crater here. Eventually that scab falls off and there's new skin underneath. So each of these photos is from that same supplement appendix. So uh, this is a similar story. Day negative six before symptoms started, had a sexual exposure. This one started having fevers and generalized symptoms. Um, developed one spot perianally, kind of this tissue with a crater. Uh, that was tested, and they had severe rectal pain, which was initially treated as an outpatient, but then because it became so painful, they were admitted, and at that point, they were found to have these other areas of sort of disseminated monkeypox, where again, you can see this isn't a big thing, but it's kind of tissue-y and, um, and filled with this proteinaceous material. So Tammy, to get to your question, if you touch that with bare skin, not knowing what it was, uh, you would be at risk of transmission of monkeypox in that setting. Uh, so we're going to talk about infection prevention a little bit uh, in a second, um, but this is something that if we do need to admit folks that have monkeypox, we'll want to be aware of as far as uh, preventing transmission to our workers. Uh, here's another example. About one week prior, had a sexual encounter. Um, that person did have some vesicles on his back at that time. Uh, they got a perianal mass, so not really what we would typically think of as a uh, pox, and then developed uh, vesicular kind of pox lesions everywhere else. Um, and then this got also confirmed with uh, the PCR testing. So these are, you know, the more severe presentations. I think one concern that's out there is, are there quieter presentations that 
are just not manifesting fully or not showing up or not painful that people aren't noticing. And that's where that community transmission uh, can occur. Uh, this patient had some sexual exposure sometime within the last month. Uh, they didn't know where because of multiple uh, partners. Uh, but this was a tonsillitis that occurred and uh, also developed a generalized rash uh, by day three. So this is more of an immune phenomenon rather than monkeypox, you know, poxes showing up. Uh, and then uh, ended up needing to be admitted to the hospital um, because they couldn't eat and they were so ill. So um, you can kind of see these ulcerative lesions here. You guys see a lot of tonsillitis out there. It's usually strep, but if your strep test is negative, you need to make sure you take a sexual history and uh, are aware, does this person have risk factors for STDs? Because this could be gonorrhea, pharyngitis too, and those all require specific swabs. So uh, here's another person, had sexual contact, um, fever, felt ill, developed just one spot on their foot and one spot on their finger. So again, had an exposure, had some degree of dissemination, so they felt ill and manifested in just this kind of unique way. So here's day five, day nine, you've got this kind of fleshy thing. And then by day 22, it has come off and is healing. So, uh, you know, that would be the time that they'd say this isn't contagious anymore. So here's a bad example of a nose lesion. So um, had a sexual exposure um, and then developed this nose spot, developed generalized illness and got some forearm spots also, monkeypox positive. Um, because this was progressive and disfiguring, they got admitted and received IV antiviral therapy, which we're gonna talk about. Uh, and then eventually were discharged a little over a week later as it started to dry up. So here's another example. Two weeks prior, had a sexual exposure, started to feel generally unwell, developed these kind of fleshy, kind of cratered lesions. Uh, also got some uh, in the perianal area and on the gluteal area. Uh, those started to scab, but a few of them persisted. And so this person ended up being in isolation for several weeks, waiting for these things to kind of cool off. Okay, so here's another one. Um, had a sexual exposure, got a sore throat and tongue spots, and you can see kind of got this cratered area on the tongue and then developed these secondary areas here and here. Also had some rash on the soles uh, of his feet. Um, you know, depending on how this showed up, if this was the main manifestation, you might look at that and think that this was shingles. You know, we see a lot of shingles here. Um, so be aware of other spots that don't fit the dermatomal pattern of shingles. Uh, and then also that sexual history is important. So I'm going to show you some photos of other things, and then we can talk a little bit about questions you might have about the rash uh, presentations. Um, so what else could it be if it's not monkeypox? Well, here in Iowa, it's actually more likely to be these other things because we don't have a lot of monkeypox uh, yet. And hopefully we won't. So it could be HSV-1, which is 90% of the oral herpes viruses we see. It could be HSV-2, which accounts for 90% of the genital herpes virus we see. It could be chickenpox or shingles. It could be syphilis, could be gonorrhea, could be molluscum. It could be impetigo or a boil. Um, the patient that I tested, I think that's what he had. He had a little staphylococcal folliculitis perianally and another little spot on his lip, but it fit the pattern closely enough that we tested him, came back negative. We treated him with doxycycline uh, for a staph folliculitis and he got better. Uh, or there's this thing called ORF virus, which you may remember I've talked with you about before because it's carried in sheep and goats and we actually see it around here every once in a while. Dr. Pogue got this case to me, which I thought was phenomenal. Uh, this is a parapox, it's not a true pox. So this is ORF on somebody's finger, um, has this kind of scalloped border, so it isn't truly a pox virus. This is a photo Dr. Killian sent me. I was impressed with her astuteness. Um, this patient had these kind of clustered things and you know, looked pox-ish, so we sent this for testing. Remember, 
There's more than just monkeypox, though. So we sent this for monkeypox. We also sent it for uh, HSV. And so this came back as HSV1. So this is called herpetic whitlow. If you get HSV1 on a finger, um, you know, if somebody, if your dentist will get this, this guy was a, a veterinarian of some sort. So exposure to kind of the mouths of different things, if that's where HSV normally lives. Um, this is a shingles outbreak. So here you can see that this cluster of vesicles is in different um, kind of levels of development. You've got some later ones and some earlier ones, and it's a little bit more fluid and a little bit less tissue. Uh, this is HSV, perianal HSV, uh, which again is fluid, but you know, if you look at this closely, this doesn't look that different than monkeypox. So you have to be thinking of both. Uh, and then this is a primary syphilitic chancre. So this is syphilis. Um, syphilis can look any way it wants though. So you also have to be thinking of syphilis uh, with these folks. It's a little ulcer. Sometimes it's a tissuey thing. And then also syphilis can disseminate as well. So these are the things you want to be thinking of. If you're testing somebody for monkeypox, you should probably be testing them for herpes, syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. Uh, you know, the ORF, the ORF is more just a curiosity. Um, unless they've been bitten by a sheep, you don't need to test for ORF. <laughs> Um, so diagnosis. So this is important because if you see this, you need to know the right way to do it. And it's not easy. Um, right now, the only way to do the test is by sending studies to the state hygienic lab or to the CDC. What they request is that you swab two separate spots and each spot with two different swabs. So here at Mary Greeley, we have specific monkeypox test kits. So you should call the lab and they will deliver you the test kit. Mary Greeley has a similar process. Call the lab. The lab techs know what swabs you need to use. If you send the wrong swab, it will be rejected and they won't run the test because there are inhibitors on certain types of materials on certain types of swabs that just invalidate it. So that would be really disappointing to go to all the trouble to do all the paperwork to get all these swabs and then just have it be rejected. So please, please, please talk with the lab and confirm you're using the right swab. Then it's two swabs for two sites and they are requiring that. The reason they do two is the first one gets run at the state hygienic lab, so you can get an answer right away. It's usually within 24 hours. Uh, and then if it's positive, they will send it on to the CDC for confirmation. But basically, the test is good, and it'll, it'll work. So if you get a positive from the state hygienic lab, that's positive, and you can move into the kind of the treatment uh, process. It is cumbersome. There is a fair amount of paperwork, and you do have to call IDPH to get this done. They do have an after-hours number uh, if it's you know late or on the weekend. And this is a PCR test, so it's it's pretty sensitive. And you can see you just um, put the swab right down into the middle of one of those uh, kind of cratered areas or uh, one of the uh, heaped-up lesions. Um, this is contagious, skin to skin. So. Um, we are taking a very cautious approach with how we're doing contact uh, kind of precautions. So right now it is gowns, gloves, and then um, goggles and actually a respirator. So either a capper uh, or an N95. That seems like a lot to me with the respiratory stuff. We're really not seeing this spread in an aerosolized way. Um, maybe it would be possible if you had a patient that had like that severe pneumonitis form. But on the other hand, uh, we don't know a lot about how this is spreading yet. This is still fairly early, so it's worth uh, your while to uh, take the precautions necessary because if you do get monkeypox, then you're going to be stuck at home for weeks uh, waiting for this to resolve. You won't be able to come to work, and I don't want that for you. Um, so anyway, if you have any questions about this, talk with uh, Emily Law or me or Kelly Hartwig about uh, what kind of precautions you need to use, um, uh, especially as you're going through the specimen collection process. So who needs treatment? So it would be people that have a severe manifestation uh, or who are immunocompromised. Uh, children under eight are a higher risk for severe outcomes. Pregnant or breastfeeding, and if somebody has eye involvement, uh, those would all be reasons. This is a CT scan of somebody that has terrible proctitis related to this infection and was unable to have a bowel movement without pain control. Uh, this is another example of just these fleshy nodules all at the same kind of level of development. 
Waste management, fortunately, does not seem to be a major issue. If it was that clade one, where we would be worried about a 15% mortality, that's where we get really uh, interested in a lot of care uh, with all the gear because this is just not that severe of an illness. CDC recommends just kind of usual waste management uh, for this. There is an antiviral therapy that is available, tecoviramat. Um, it's these black and orange pills. And it does seem like this is pretty well tolerated. It shortens duration of symptoms. Doesn't seem like there's a lot of side effects, maybe some headache. Um, it is IV or oral, so if the patient can't eat, uh, we can give it an IV form. We have to order this from the CDC. So if we get somebody that has one of these risk factors and we need it, we will order it. Um, and I guess what I would suggest is if you have a patient that you've uh, tested for monkeypox, uh, let me or Dr. Rirai know. Uh, if you have a patient that you get a confirmed case, by all means, send them to us and we will make this process happen. Uh, for now, it's rare enough that we'd like to be involved uh, in this process so that we can serve as a resource for the rest of you. If we start to see a lot of it, um, then we'll start to diffuse that responsibility a little bit more. There are other antivirals that are effective. Sidofovir, though, is very nephrotoxic, so we don't want to use that unless we have to. Brin Sidofovir also has to come from the CDC, so if we get to that point, we'll probably just use the Tecoviramat. And then this is important because it can be on the face. If there's any question about involvement of eye structures, they recommend topical treatments to prevent any further invasion of the eye. Um, with trifluoridine, I would probably involve ophthalmology if I had any concerns about that at all. So the vaccines, there are two vaccines available. Um, this is the traditional smallpox vaccine um, that is a replicant competent virus, so it doesn't work for you know, competent people. Uh, there is a stockpile of this uh, because of the risk of smallpox as a biologic weapon. Uh, this is not being used broadly. This is like the one that leaves the scar. Um, so that is out there. It's available if this ever achieved sort of liftoff, but nobody anticipates that happening. What is being used is this Genios vaccine. So this is a non-replicating vaccinia virus. It's actually more closely related to uh, horsepox rather than cowpox. Um, and it is safe in immunocompromised people. It's two doses, one month apart. There was a very short supply early on. So this created uh, challenges with distribution. At first, they were only giving it to people who had monkeypox, because you can sometimes vaccinate people who are actively infected or people that had a recent exposure where it was known you were around somebody with monkeypox. The challenge was that um, we knew that this was spreading in uh, high-risk people. And so as they've gotten the supply up by getting some of it back from the manufacturer uh, overseas, they've been able to start spreading this out to more and more high-risk groups. So starting two weeks ago, we were able to start uh, vaccinating people that had some high-risk exposure, uh, men who have sex with men, people with HIV, people who have a known monkeypox exposure. At first, it was challenging because they were only offering it in Des Moines, Johnson County, and I think um, out in Sioux City. Uh, so we made a request and got some at Iowa State. Uh, so that is available. It's not on the list right now. But if you have a patient that you think qualifies for vaccination on the basis of these risk factors, uh, you can call Thielen Student Health and they will help make arrangements to get your patient vaccinated. Your patient can also call Polk County. Um, you know, they can go down to Des Moines, but if, if you're in town here and you want to get it done, you can call Thielen Student Health. Um, Jessica Shannon is their uh, assistant director of nursing. If you're having any trouble with that, give us a call. We're happy to help. Uh, we've gotten a number of people vaccinated. This all has to do with distribution, similar to like the COVID vaccines where they would only give it if you had cases and there weren't many cases in Iowa. So we didn't get a lot. Um, that's starting to loosen up now. And so we're getting more and more vaccine out there, which couldn't have come at a better time because we were just getting onto the upswing of our local curve uh, when these vaccines showed up. And so I actually think that we have um, nipped it in the bud, so to speak. And fortunately, we're not seeing extensive uh, transmission in Iowa. I think we also just need to address the fact that monkeypox has been circulating in Africa for over a decade. 
And we have had Genios available in our national stockpile throughout that time. And you know, the, the company that makes it could have been making it all this time. And if we had made public investments in assisting these countries get people vaccinated, we might not be here today. So just remember that viruses in general do not respect national borders. We have resources here, and if we can help other countries get vaccines done, it actually does help us. Uh, it is worth doing. Uh, better for them, better for us. There's immunoglobulin available. Uh, if somebody was you know, dramatically ill, you can get that through CDC, um, kind of like we did with convalescent plasma for COVID. And then uh, you know, this is an important aspect of this. So how do you prevent this from happening? You avoid skin-to-skin -skin contact. If you're not having skin-to-skin -skin contact, then uh, that won't ha you won't see transmission. So CDC has been very clear about, you know, if, if, if you avoid skin-to-skin -skin contact, we won't see transmission. This might be a time to decrease uh, high-risk activities. But then they have also gone ahead and said, if you aren't going to decrease high-risk activities, how can you modify your activities to make this less risky? So uh, they have a great resource online that you can share with your patients uh, about avoiding particularly high-risk sex or anonymous sex and how to minimize exposure uh, through either virtual sex, leaving clothes on, using other barrier protection, and instructions about how to wash particular gear. It seems easy to say, well, just if you don't have sexual interactions, this won't spread. Um, but I also think it's just it's important to remember that um, everybody has different ways of viewing the world and different uh, values. And the way I think about it is, you know, back in the early days of COVID, we had a lot of uh, family members and stuff saying, well, gosh, Lois is pregnant. Maybe you should sleep in an apartment, Dan. Maybe you shouldn't go home. And we just felt like, well, what we value is being able to, you know, be a family. And when we decided to take that risk. And so there are people out there that they're aware this is happening, but to them with their uh, values, it's, they're only going to change their behavior so much. And so we need to meet people where they're at and continue to support them however we can. So CDC has a lot of great resources on that front. So take home points. Um, this is transmitted skin to skin. Anybody can get it. Um, right now, it seems like it is primarily in men who have sex with men. It is mostly a rash illness. There's very little disseminated or life-threatening disease. The rash lasts two to four weeks and people are isolated and at home. Vaccination is very effective and seems to be bending the curve down. Treatment is available uh, for especially people that are high risk, and we need to wear our gear so that we don't get this, so that we're not stuck at home uh, or obviously giving it to family members and that sort of thing. If you only remember one thing, it is if you have a high risk patient, get them vaccinated. Um, because that's really going to be what bends this curve down. And I'm very hopeful that if we can get enough people vaccinated that are uh, at high risk, that we can change this R value from more than one where it's spreading to less than one where it wilts and dies and goes away. And unlike even a month ago where public health seemed like they were kind of worried about this achieving liftoff, generally, I'm hearing more hopeful signals now that we think we might be able to get in front of it. So that's the talk about monkeypox. I would be happy to take any questions before we go into a uh, COVID vaccine update. Yeah. Some of, these, some of the lesions you were showing looked so subtle. Do, you, do the patients complain that that particular spot is so painful and that's how they are made aware of it? Because some of them are in regions that maybe a patient can't get, you know, wouldn't see just by, without doing closer inspection of their body? Is it the pain that directs them to that spot? Generally speaking, yes. It seems like these are pretty painful. Um, that seems to be a, a common thread. I, I can't say that they're always painful, but it seems like they're generally painful and there is some associated fever and illness. So you might imagine, uh, I've been forwarded a whole lot of rash photos in the last month. <laughs> Uh, and generally speaking, they're just, they're rashes. And, you know, the first question is, is this a person that fits kind of our high risk group? Is this person systemically ill? And does that rash have that kind of fleshy look to it? Um, fortunately, even with photos, you can kind of get a good sense of all of that. Um, but I think if you have a patient who is ill with fevers and has risk factors and is talking about a painful spot here or there, 
Uh, yeah, swab it and um, try and figure it out. Now, they're usually multiple, which is why public health has said you have to swab two spots because they don't want us you know, aggressively going after just one spot when that's probably not monkeypox. But you do have to have your radar up about it. And I can say that the person I swabbed, I thought it was probably not monkeypox because it didn't look quite right, but it was like, gosh, I don't want to miss this, you know? <laughs> uh, so we checked it and it was negative. So yeah, Tammy. Looking at like day seven, mm -hmm. maybe the, and I'm looking, I'm thinking of what we swab. Would we go for the one with the white in the middle? Because none of, I mean, are we going to just get a dry swab? Or are we going to, um, I'm sorry, day seven, the next one next to the tongue on the bottom? Here. There. Yeah, I mean, if you put your swab right into that middle spot, that's what you'd be going for. Um, I think if I had to pick between like that kind of spot and this kind of spot, you'd want the more kind of fleshy fluid type one as opposed to the flatter dry one. But if you swab, you know, a crater in the tongue or an aphthous ulcer, that's going to be really high yield also. Um, if you have a patient, I guarantee if you have a patient that you call Iowa Department of Public Health and you say, this patient you know, had a high risk sexual exposure seven days ago, they're febrile, I only have one spot on the tongue, I'm worried about monkeypox, can I test them? I, I think at this point, a month ago they might have said no, I think at this point they'll let it happen. So uh, generally it'll be multiple, but Iowa Public, Department of Public Health has been really great at working with us on this. Got a couple online questions. Yeah. The first one is, is there a risk for fomite transmission? So technically, yes, there is a risk of fomite transmission. Um, that is sort of this diagram here on surfaces or clothing. Um, I can't tell you the details of, of how that is known. I'm betting that uh, in folks that have monkeypox, they've done studies where they've done swabs from the environment and found monkeypox DNA. What I don't know is if there's been ever, ever any cases where they actually documented like somebody sat in a chair after somebody else who had monkeypox. I don't think that's ever been shown. Um, and just with the characteristics of this outbreak, it really is skin to skin contact that is driving this. So we are going to pay attention to that from a, a risk standpoint with our, you know, clean up and everything, but is this like what's driving this current outbreak? No, I don't think fomites are the main thing. And we saw that with COVID too, where, you know, wipe down your groceries when they show up. And that, you know, although that might technically be true, it's practically not true. And I, I think that'll be what happens with monkeypox. It's not practically true. Okay, the other question is, is there a test for an individual without lesions, like a blood test? There are blood tests available. There's IgM and IgG studies available. Um, right now, those are primarily research-oriented through the CDC. I'm not sure we have access to those yet. I imagine one day we will. Um, the challenge is, you know, kind of like, you know, if you are looking at a herpes infection or a, a chickenpox infection, the best way to get it is to find the active DNA. That's what really proves it. That's, that'd be the most specific answer. Serologies can be helpful for seroprevalence surveys. And if you have a before and an after where they transition from negative to positive, that's pretty reliable. But one time serologies suffer from false positive results and they're just a little bit harder to pin down. So those DNA based tests are going to be more reliable. for the blood. Cindy from the lab is going to give us an update. Currently, no, for the serologies for the lab. And they've told us, like at the state hygienic lab, it will come eventually because we've had that question. Okay. It's not right now. Okay, so just to repeat, the lab officially says that it's not available, but it will be eventually, the serologies, the blood tests. Okay, let's talk about COVID vaccinations. Um, so we're gonna move through some of this quickly. So this is where COVID is at right now. We had our first bad winter, we had our second bad winter, and now we're going into another winter. So where are we gonna go? So Omicron really hit us hard last year. Um, 
huge numbers of cases. Uh, fortunately, at that point, most people were vaccinated. Um, what we saw was there were increases in death rates associated with Omicron, primarily in unvaccinated people. Uh, Omicron rates have come down. Omicron remains the main variant we're seeing. Um, but over the course of the last couple of months, we've been seeing an, an updrift in cases, and we've seen that both nationally uh, and here at Mary Greeley. Uh, what has not necessarily followed is a high increase in the number of deaths. So uh, we call that decoupling death from infection, and that is uh, largely in due, due to vaccination and also prior exposure. So the immunity level of the community, whether it's vaccines, infection, or both, is just higher. What I think we are seeing and what I think winter will bring is more hospitalizations related to people that have comorbidities and are older. So people that have heart and lung and kidney disease already are already at risk to get hospitalized because of those diseases. And then they sort of get tipped over by COVID because COVID is broadly circulating because it's really contagious. Uh, the challenge is going to be um, caring for all those folks all at once, especially since many of those people are people that come into the hospital and then go to a nursing or rehab facility afterwards who may not take them because they're COVID positive, even if the COVID is not necessarily contributing um, to their illness in a meaningful way. So I think that will be our challenge this winter. I don't think this winter is going to be a, a huge ICU COVID time like it has been the last uh, two years. So when we talk about this vaccine and why are we talking about Omicron bivalent vaccines, um, what we need to know is, are the old ones working well enough uh, and does the new one work in a different way that, that makes it worth doing? And we should ask safety concerns too. And so when the ACIP, the kind of the group that decides about recommending vaccines, looked at this, they put together a really nice slide deck of all the details that kind of explain their thinking to be as transparent as possible. And you can find that at the bottom here um, and go through this whole thing. But a lot of these are directly from that. So what they're seeing is exactly what I just described, where there are increasing cases uh, in um, older folks that have comorbidities um, as far as hospitalizations. What they're also seeing is um, that people that have had only, so this is uh, all folks, compared to unvaccinated folks, um, people that are vaccinated still are less likely to end up being hospitalized. So there is that benefit of prior infection, even if you're unvaccinated, but it is not quite doing as well as the vaccine over time. There's a lot of subtlety and detail to that, but basically the vaccines continue to perform very well. Uh, this is an interesting study where it looks at, um, uh, based on, did you get just a booster? Did you get... Uh, just the primary series. And what they saw was um, that if you got one booster dose, you generally did a little bit better than if you only had the primary series. So it kind of suggests that uh, having had a booster was helpful. And then this one looked at people over 50, people that had two booster doses did better than people over 50 that did only had had the one booster dose. It's important, though, to look at the scale over here. The farther down this road we get, the smaller the absolute numbers. So even though uh, people that had two boosters were um, three times less likely to end up in the hospital, the absolute number here was like less than one in 100,000. So there is a benefit, but, but like I said, the farther down this COVID road we get, we're starting to see those, those benefits become harder to parse out between groups. Um, so, but it is sort of proof of concept that, that that seems to be getting that extra dose makes a difference. When we talk about what variant is predominant, you see these different numbers coming out. I just wanted to explain that. So we had the alpha and then the delta, and now Omicron is all of these BA ones. So when we talk about the vaccine that's going to be available, that is targeting the spike protein that was on BA1. We are now on to BA5, but there hasn't been a meaningful change in the spike protein between BA1 and BA5. So when we talk about uh, these vaccines, what the new vaccines are is 50% of the ancestral old original vaccine and then 50% of the BA1 vaccine. It's the same sort of total dose, but now it's half and half. Um, and that's... Uh, 
true with the Moderna and then true with the uh, Pfizer as well. The idea is we keep stimulating that original immune response with the ancestral one, but we also try to remind your immune system that things change and giving a slightly different spike protein tells your immune system, huh, maybe we need to be ready for some variation. There has been some discussion about people that have maybe had COVID more than once um, that, gosh, it seems like people that get Omicron can just get Omicron again and again. And I think maybe some of you have actually experienced getting Omicron more than once. Um, it turns out that there have been some studies looking at uh, how protective is getting alpha against getting Omicron again versus delta against getting Omicron again versus Omicron and getting Omicron again. And actually, Omicron does protect you against getting Omicron again better than having had alpha or delta. So I think people talk about getting Omicron more than once and we remember it. So there's a little bit of a, a bias of memory there. But generally speaking, if you've gotten Omicron, Omicron it is protective uh, against future Omicron infections. Like you would expect, if you get a virus, you usually don't get it again. But it's not perfect. So, um, you know, what FDA said is they're not going to require the uh, pharmaceutical companies to do these giant 50,000 people studies. Those take a long time and they're very expensive to do. So instead they said, let's look at antibody levels. And so they said, if you've not previously had COVID, let's look at your pre and post uh, dose with these vaccines. And basically the ancestral antibody, it drives it nice and higher with the kind of Omicron specific type antibody, it drove it nice and higher. If somebody has had COVID before, as you might expect, their baseline antibody levels are already higher. And then when they get vaccinated, they go even higher. So what happens is when you can't do the big studies, you're looking for alternative measures to show something is working and measuring antibody levels, I think from a speed standpoint is the best we're gonna get in terms of showing that this uh, is going to work. And generally speaking, antibody levels are associated with uh, protection. As you also know, antibody levels wane over time. Antibodies aren't the only story. So high antibody levels will potentially protect you from getting COVID at all over several months. After that, they tend to wane, and then you are still protected from severe infection uh, by your more complicated part of your immune system called the T cells. Um, so then I think what CDC is trying to do is get us all vaccinated now maximize our community immune protection so that when we move through influenza season and this kind of COVID bump that we're not all sick when we're also trying to take care of uh, our patients. And also if we can just blunt the number of people getting sick, even if they're not necessarily dying in the ICU, if we're not filling up the hospitals and grinding the wheels of healthcare to a halt like we kind of did last winter, uh, we can see some real benefit. I also think CDC is trying to align these vaccines in the fall like we've done with influenza vaccine. And it remains unclear if this is something we're going to need every year or if it'll be something that just high risk people need yearly, or maybe if antibody protection lasts longer with a, a bivalent process, maybe we won't need them again at all. That seems a little bit optimistic. I think we'll need these again, probably in the fall and maybe yearly for a little while. The good news is that it seems like from a side effect standpoint, the general notion was that people had their worst response after the second vaccine. This new vaccine is acting more like the first time you got your shot. So there's just lower doses of the ancestral one. So people aren't reacting quite as hard uh, with fevers and feeling just kind of yucky. So it was more like your first shot where you might get a sore arm, but you're not going to feel really, really ill. This was safety data, data from about 500 people that got the bivalent of the Moderna. Pfizer has safety data from about 600 people that got their bivalent. And it's kind of the same. No major severe reactions uh, and didn't seem like it had quite as much kind of the yucky feeling. I know that I'm still going to try and get mine on a Friday um, just, <laughs> just because you just don't always feel great the day after. Um, they also, in this slide deck, if you do have time and you're interested in the pericarditis discussion, there's a, a very nice summary and discussion about pericarditis and who's at most risk. And the reason that uh, this recommendation still holds firm for young men who are at higher risk of pericarditis. The bottom line is that getting COVID puts you at higher risk of pericarditis than the vaccine does. And if you don't get vaccinated, there's a much better chance you're gonna get COVID and get pericarditis anyway. 
And we've had a couple cases of pericarditis, myocarditis just in the last month here. So the nuts and bolts, uh, if you've had your primary series, you have to wait at least two months from your most recent booster before you get this bivalent booster. So that's the number to remember. After a prior vaccine, you wait two months and then you go forward. Um, uh, you can no longer get a booster with just the ancestral one. So you, you just can't do that anymore. It's no longer approved. You have, if you're going to get boosters, they have to be this bivalent one. Um, the primary series is still the ancestral one, though. And you might say, well, why is that? That's because that's, that's what was studied as far as generating this initial building block of immunity. The bivalent Omicron protection is assumed to be on top of that original building block. So that's why you still get the original one if you haven't been vaccinated at all yet. It is not yet available for five to 11 year olds. Uh, I think that's because they're still working on the dosing. I think very soon that they'll get that dosing worked out and we'll start seeing it available uh, for our younger population also. Other considerations, I've been asked this a lot. What if you just had COVID? Well, it's, uh, it's a little bit of, you know, uh, like humans are, we're all different. So the answer is a little bit different. So if you are a very low risk person and you just had Omicron, you can wait for about three months before getting your bivalent booster because you've got that kind of protective immunity from your Omicron infection. However, if you're a high risk person, like you're on chemotherapy or you have an immune problem, you can get your Omicron booster as soon as you feel better from your Omicron infection. So they want you to wait at least a couple weeks. I usually say wait about four to six, make sure you're totally better from your infection and then you can get your booster. So they're kind of saying both, at least wait until you're better from your Omicron. But if you're a healthy person, you can wait up to three months. And, you know, depends on kind of how bad it is in your community. So I know I blew through that, but basically uh, they're recommended because it, it addresses more specifically the Omicron variant. And what we hope is this will really help bring down the number of cases we see over the winter and uh, get us through a winter where we don't have 500,000 people die like the last two years. So um, we need all the help we can get getting this out to people um, and protecting the community. And um, I, I think they're really trying to get this on a schedule where we expect COVID to be more of a seasonal illness as we move forward. It takes a little while with new pandemics to kind of achieve that seasonal aspect, uh, kind of like influenza did in 1918, but I think it will eventually. Um, I would also like to put in a plug for, we've been doing this COVID thing a long time. I think we're all tired of it, but we also still have a lot of vulnerable patients in our walls. And um, the more we can be vigilant with wearing our gear as it's recommended, the better we'll do from the standpoint of our patients. What we don't want is a patient to come in here without COVID and then get COVID while they're here because we weren't following our gear recommendations. So those are there for a reason. Please help me with that. I think especially as we're going in the next couple months, we're going to see a lot of COVID and we need to follow these practices uh, uh, really closely to prevent in-house transmission. Novavax is available. These are the treatments. I'm going to skip all that because um, we're out of time. But basically, vaccines are available. Um, we've done one group vaccine thing here at Mary Greeley. We're doing another one Monday. And McFarland is starting Friday and going next Friday. So sorry I went over. I'm happy to take any questions right now. Yeah, Dr. Burrow. Great question. Yep, so, um, so Paxlovid is the pill. Uh, the only challenge we have with it is that it's got drug interactions. So many patients aren't candidates because certain drug-drug interactions. In that case, our best next option for a minimally ill, high-risk person who's an outpatient, doesn't need to come in, is to get a monoclonal antibody. Right now, the way that's happening is you just send them to the emergency department. Over the last winter, because our volume was so high, we worked out something with the house manager where you could call and they would coordinate an infusion. And there's a lot of nuts and bolts to that, that when we stopped using it, it went away. If we get to a point where it seems like we're using it that much that we need to recreate that process, I think we will. But for now, it's just send your patient to the ER and, and, and they are, the ER is like super experts at this. So they, they'll know exactly what to do. And I would encourage you to call your colleagues too about the Paxlovid drug interactions. If, if there's something you're not sure about, 
it's possible that that drug can be held or you can do something else to still use Paxlovid and not, not have to need the bebtilevimab. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, Dr. Fulton. Great, as always.